Welcome to the National Virtual Lend Trainee Research Conference. I'm Alice Kuo, Principal Investigator of the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health and Director of the University of California Le Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities Program. The ARP establishes and maintains an interdisciplinary, multi-center research network for scientific collaboration and infrastructure to increase the life expectancy and quality of life for autistic individuals, particularly for underserved and marginalized populations. The mission of the ARP is to, create, is to support innovative life course intervention research that promotes optimal health and well-being of autistic individuals across the lifespan. I wanna put a plug in for our Infrastructure for Collaborative Research, or the ICR. The ICR facilitates cross-program data collection for research studies. Some potential projects we have on the horizon for next year include focus groups or surveys on early intervention services and measuring sleep in the autistic population. I want everyone in the LEND program to keep this in mind for future multi-site LEND capstone projects. So if you're interested in collecting data across different LEND programs, consider reaching out to us to be able to use the ICR to help you for your data collection. The ARP LEND committee creates opportunities for LEND programs within the ARP network. So trainees are able to get involved in research on autism and physical health. So far, this committee has created a seminar series on the six ARP research nodes. The videos are already finished and a curriculum is being developed to be implemented next year, focusing on discussions using a flipped classroom model. And of course, the LEN committee has put together this first annual national virtual LEN trainee research conference. So congratulations to all the trainees who had their presentations accepted and I hope to see you next year for the second annual National Virtual LEN Trainee Conference. Thank you. Hi, my name is Liz. I am a white woman with brown curly hair, wearing a black shirt. I am currently a psychology postdoctoral fellow through the LEN Training Program at JFK Partners, which is part of the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Today, I'm going to be walking us through how our interdisciplinary team has embedded neurodiversity affirming practices within our diagnostic evaluations. So a little bit of background on neurodiversity. The movement was started by autistic sociologist Judy Singer and was really born out of a need to shift the historical thinking around neurodevelopmental conditions, which really focused on individual level pathology or deficits and shifting that lens and focus to think about differences um, in thinking and behavior for neurodivergent individuals. So one thing that's really unique to being a neurodivergent individual is understanding that part of one's identity similar to being a person with a disability, is this involves a medical diagnosis. And so as clinicians, we're in a really unique position when it comes to helping neurodivergent individuals understand that aspect of themselves and also um, in helping to shape a positive sense of identity. So, our, inter our team is interdisciplinary and consists of faculty and LEND trainees across speech language, psychology, and occupational therapy disciplines. And I'm going to walk us through the changes that we've made across our evaluation process to embed neurodiversity uh, affirming practices. So starting with the intake, um, we begin to talk about the um, neurodiversity and using that lens. Um, oftentimes after we're talking with the family about their goals for the evaluation and starting to frame the overall process that we'll use, um, we a lot of times frame that having diagnoses and working under the medical model 
is needed from a practical standpoint in terms of being able to access supports and a neurodiversity lens can be really helpful in understanding their child or teen's unique patterns of strengths and also the challenges that they're running against in certain environments. And so it's also really helpful to not just assess the family's familiarity with the concept of neurodiversity, but also assess their familiarity and experience with individuals that are neurodivergent. And so for parents, it's really helpful to ask about this during the family or medical history. And for kids and teens, we find it's more helpful to talk about whenever we're doing more of a one-on-one -on -one interview during the day of the evaluation. So during the feedback, that is when we're providing that diagnostic information and really helping um, shape the family's understanding of this newfound identity. And so we want to frame it both as a lens for understanding oneself, one's um, strengths, challenges, um, as a function of different environments, context, and also thinking about that diagnosis as helping to validate the need for supports in different different areas. Whenever we're talking about the results of the evaluation, we also want to make sure to emphasize the strengths that we saw. So um, as we go into the report, we want to continue both that um, through line when it comes to having a neurodiversity lens and avoiding deficit-based language in our write-up, and also continuing to think about recommendations really being tailored to the individual support needs, interest, and the types of environments and context that are most um, valuable and relevant to them, and also continuing to provide um, support and thinking about neurodiversity by providing additional resources to continue that conversation. So our team has found this, these changes to be really helpful, especially in terms of combating stigma related to neurodevelopmental disorders, disability, and also as medical providers, whenever we are the ones who are bringing up the concept of neurodiversity, it really validates that perspective um, and really validates the need for having that lens um, as being helpful for people's emotional well-being and self-understanding. Um, there's still more work that needs to be done. Um, we're at the really beginning phases of thinking about how to implement this as a field. And so um, first off, um, as a field, we sort of have to establish what we feel best practices are for embedding this approach within evaluations and be able to disseminate that broadly. Um, and also just thinking from a research perspective, being able to integrate and embed the preferences and experiences of families and self-advocates in thinking about the diagnostic evaluation process. So here's my contact information for any questions or follow-up. I really want to thank my supervisors, Dr. Audrey Blakely-Smith and Dr. Judy Reven for being leaders and creating these changes in our evaluations and really prioritizing these conversations within our team. And also um, a special thanks to our whole team for um, collaborating with making these changes and sharing their perspectives and ideas. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mei Chow, and I am an audiology student from the University of Memphis. I am an Asian woman with black hair, and I am wearing a blue shirt. Today, I'm going to present on multi-level neural assessment of auditory function during speech listening, a step towards more comprehensive hearing evaluations for the AIRP research day, integrating both behavior and objective measures into an audiologic 
test batteries help us gain a comprehensive understanding of the entire auditory pathway. However, current testing open necklace measures beyond the brainstem. In a previous study from 2019, a new approach called chirp speech was introduced to elect robust neural responses from the brainstem to the auditory cortex. The primary goal of our study is to assess the effectiveness of using chirp speech to measure auditory brain response in conjunction with speech testing, with the aim of evaluating its potential for future clinical applications. We conducted our study with 25 adults who have normal hearing, right-handed native English speakers without any neurological disorders. The auditory stimuli used in this study are clean and cheap modified AZ bio sentences. The AZ bio sentences test is a speech recognition test commonly used in clinic to assess adults with CI, uh, cochlear implants, both in quiet and in noise. Participants listen to AZ bio sentence at quiet plus three SNR plus three dB signal to noise ratio and minus three signal to noise ratio and brain response were recorded while participants perform a speech recognition task. Our figure A shows the speech recognition scores at different conditions. Blue indicates the cheat condition, and orange indicates clear speech. Then from left to right, we have inquired SNR plus 3 and SNR minus 3. In general, using the chip master resulting in slightly poorer speech recognition compared to clear speech. This effect varies across SNR conditions. Our figure B and C shows how evoked response potential is associated with speech recognition in noise. And red indicates plus three and blue indicates minus three SNR condition. The horizontal axis shows the latency, and the vertical axis shows speech recognition performance. So, in general, speech condition shows slightly poor recognition than clear speech. And in addition, our study found the brain response varied depending on the level of background noise. The more challenged signal to noise ratio resulted in smaller brain response amplitude. Overall, the cheat method and background noise levels significantly affected speech recognition and brain response. Fast and brain response latencies were associated with better speech recognition. While the cheat method is relatively new and there are still some uncertainties. However, our study suggests its potential for efficient and affordable simultaneous brain response and speech testing in clinical settings, which could greatly benefit real-world practice. So now let's start with the first question. How does research make an impact in the real world? Our research introduced a new method by combining brain response brain measurements with speech recognition test. This connection between neural response and speech recognition sets the groundwork for future brain-based hearing assessment and treatments, resulting in improved diagnosis through personalized intervention and better quality of life for individuals with hearing difficulties. The second question is what success and have we had or foresee having in translating our research to impact the community? Um, one potential challenge we may encounter is ensuring collaboration between the researchers and audiologists to is establish standards and ensure the reliability of this new tool. Since the tests were, we are doing with the middle and low latency response are not common yet, audiology might need extra training on how to do that. They might also need to get permission from their hospital before they can use them. 
it usually takes a long time before a new protocol or doing things getting used in most clinics. Plus, there's still a lot we don't know about speech and auditory processing, and some of the research might not work in real-life clinics. One of our potential uh, positive outcomes we anticipate is to provide more accurate evaluations for individuals who have trouble hearing even though their hearing tests appear normal. Individual experience difficulty hearing in noise environment may still have normal results on their audiogram. And this could indicate that there is an issue with how their brain process sounds, not just with their ears. So figuring out this could help these people understand why they have trouble hearing in certain occasions and Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks.